turn to Luke chapter 11. I wanted to just share briefly, G Jason, uh, Bradshaw, Jesse, and myself this week had the opportunity to be at a conference that was uh, a terrific conference. It was on the inerrancy and the infallibility and the reliability of every single jot and tittle, smallest part of a letter of the Word of God. The only thing, in addition to your eternal soul, it's going to last forever. The rest of it's all going to go away, beloved. This will last forever. That's why we pay attention to it. Uh, that's why we do everything we can to learn it, to understand it. But uh, what a week we had being affirmed in our, in our faith with regard to that. We had, uh, uh, some of you might not have made it. We, we, had, we had four days, five sermons a day. Most of the, I don't think any of them were less than an hour. And... Uh, we, uh, we, but, but each one was better than the next and uh, was terrific to see 5,000 men gathered to affirm their faith in the Word of God. We were served by 1,200 volunteers from that church who were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, people they had never met, didn't know from Adam, um, I had my shoes shine. Nobody would take it. I, I couldn't even give a tip. Um, people that were helping us uh, get the food that we needed, people that were helping clean up afterwards, people that were making sure that all the facilities were clean, people that were handing us food everywhere we went. Uh, I told Jesse every ice cream thing he saw me with, somebody gave it to me. I had no choice. It would have been, un, would have been absolutely ungracious not to accept. Um, Phenomenal. We saw God at work. Um, I told the Sunday school class, the closest to heaven that I know, except when I have time with my wife here on this earth, it's a one, it was a wonderful experience to, uh, to be there. I wish we, could have, wish we could have had you all there. One of the things we saw was a, nine, it was a 1535 Tyndale Bible those of you who don't know, uh, William Tyndale translated the Bible into English at a time when uh, the church was trying to keep the Bible from people. He said, I'm going to make this so that every plowboy in England can have a copy of the Scripture for himself. And he did, and we had a 1535 copy of that Bible, which was one year before he gave his life in uh, because that he had translated that Bible under the orders of Henry VIII. So it was a wonderful time. I, you know, I came away thinking, brother, if you're not spending time in this word every day, shame on you. God went to a lot of effort and a lot of people gave their lives so that we could have this wonderful word of God. So, boy, I'm heavy already and we haven't even started yet, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Keep going. Okay, we'll do that. Luke 11. Let's read together, beginning in verse 5. Jesus said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three lo loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is shut. Children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for uh, the study we've been having on prayer this week and one more. But Lord, if we leave it behind, if it hasn't changed our life, either we're not listening or, um, or I haven't made it clear. And I would pray that you would forgive any, any hurdle that I as the speaker would have that would cause people not to get what you're saying here. 
how critical this is and how to pray rightly. To understand that prayer is about aligning us with the will of God. It's not about treating you as a magic dispenser machine of some kind. It's this wonderful privilege to come into the throne room of the creator of the universe, express our concerns, our desires, and then say, God, please have your way in my life, in the lives of others. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful answer to prayer. I can honestly say, I think Jesse and Jason and I talking about someone in his family this week as we were driving down the street with no expectation that you could do the wonderful thing you do. And by this morning, you've already brought faith to the life of this person. Sometimes it happens that fast. Sometimes it's years. It doesn't matter when. It matters that we're faithful. Lord, to see you at work is astounding, and I pray that we will catch a glimpse, a glimpse of the fact that this is our way to unleash the power of God in our lives and in our community and our families, how we need that. Teach us again today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at this passage. We have one more week after this week. We'll move on, but Luke 11, 1 through 4, Jesus tells his disciples what to pray, and we spend some time there. Verses 5 through 13, he tells them how to pray. Two words, persistently and expectantly. Persistently, verses 5 through 8. Expectantly, verses 9 through 13. Looking again this morning at verses 5 through 13, the passage I just read, we have a reluctant neighbor who stands for God. We have the knocking neighbor who stands for the disciples and thus, by extension, stands for us. Now we saw two weeks ago, and I hope you were here, and if you weren't, please get a copy or download that sermon from the website and listen to it. We've seen that God is not really ever reluctant. You will never have an effective prayer life. You will never have an effective Christian life unless you get two things in your mind. One is that God is always good, never anything but good. Even his wrath is an expression of his goodness because he hates sin. And the second thing is that God is never reluctant, even though at times it appears that he is reluctant. We must trust him on those scores, beloved. And Jesus is telling us here, yes, there will be times when it appears that God is reluctant, but he never is. At times for his greater purposes, it will look like it. But in light of that, he's telling us how do we react. Jesus says, keep on praying. Don't stop. Don't give up. Keep praying persistently and keep praying expectantly. A lot of us are like the little boy who went to you know, his first grade of kindergarten with great expectations. Mom had told him, you're going to love this. Moms always say that, right? You're going to love school. You're going to love this class. You get to, you're going to get to read and, to, and you're going to get to write and it's going to be wonderful. And She picked him up at the end of the first day and she said, how did it go? And he said, not so great. He said, I was there all day. I don't know how to read and I don't know how to write. <laughs> it was a bad day. Disappointed expectations, you know, disappointment that it didn't go the way we thought, defeated by disappointment. I think that's like many of our prayer lives. It didn't happen. I prayed and it didn't happen. And so we quit. Jesus urges in the face of apparent reluctance, verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, because of his impudence, he will rise and he will give him whatever he needs. Pray with persistence and pray with impudence. Don't give up. That's the key verse to this passage. So what does Jesus mean when he says pray with impudence, pray with persistence? I think verses 2 through 9, I'm going to go to verse 9 as well, will show us two nuances of how we pray persistently. Two nuances to this. One is to pray tenaciously, and the second is to pray shamelessly. Tenaciously and shamelessly. Tenaciously. Look at that reluctant neighbor in verse 7. Don't bother me. Don't bother me. He's legitimately put out, right? This guy's coming at midnight of all times. 
And this guy, I mean, he's bedded down. In those days, they had usually one room in a house, two at most. During the day, it was the living area and the cooking area and everything else. And at night, you put the sleeping mats down and everybody slept on the floor. And the door shut. It's a big iron or wooden bar across that door. The kids are all laid out on their sleeping mats. Mom and dad are laid out on theirs. Everybody's asleep, and here comes this guy knocking. And the only way he can give, get up and give him anything, he's going to have to try and tiptoe across the family uh, that's laying out on the floor. He's going to have to find the bread wherever that is. He's going to have to package it up somewhere. He's going to have to go to the door and take that noisy, clangy bar off the door. He's going to have to open it up and give it to his neighbor. And so it's easier to say, don't bother me. Go somewhere else. Of course, there's nowhere else to go. There's no 7-Elevens. There's no stores that are open until midnight. A lot of us would give up at that point, right? Not this man. He's tenacious. He persists. He keeps asking until he gets his bread. And beloved, that's what Jesus is teaching. That's the way to pray. Pray tenaciously. Mean what you say and say what you mean and keep saying it. Look at verse 9. He says, I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We treat those verses as though that was, that was going after one thing. It's not. Every one of those verbs there is present tense. It means ongoing, continuous action. Jesus is saying to us, keep on all the time as a lifestyle. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. And my will will be open to you at the right time in the right way all the way through. That's what he means. Don't stop. It's not like, it's not like well, you, you know, first you, you try asking, and if that doesn't work, you start knocking, and if that doesn't work, then you, you, you seek, and then you knock. These are three words that mean the, basically the same thing. Keep being dependent on God. Keep being in touch with God. That's the point. The idea is if it doesn't happen right away, Give more energy to it, not less. Our natural tendency is to say, I didn't learn to read or write today, so it's a waste. I'm going home. I'm giving up. Don't give up. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, we, 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 we play that same game with God. We, we, we give up. No answer? Keep asking. In the face of silence, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, be tenacious. He promises, he doesn't promise anything, look, if, you, if you'll notice. He doesn't promise anything about the timing, but he promises an answer will come. An answer will come that will be in accordance with his will. Remember, we looked at James 4 last time. It's a verse we all must be acquainted with. James 4, verses 2 and 3, where James says, you know, you do not have because you do not ask. Two problems. In the third verse, there's the second problem. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You want what you want instead of wanting what God wants. Why do we not have? Because we don't ask. We got discouraged. The answer was delayed and we decided that God wasn't interested. We gave up. But that's not the problem. The problem is us. The problem is never God. It's never God. It's always us. That, note, note that second thing. It's possible to ask wrongly. Here's the key. Persistent prayer is still prayer about His will, not mine. That's why He teaches us in the Lord's Prayer that we preach not for my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, but for your will, God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the framework for the whole time. That's always the framework for our prayer time. We might easily ask God to prosper our new business, right? Because we want to make a lot of money. We want to live a comfortable existence and go into a comfortable retirement and a comfortable place where we can do comfortable things. That would only mean we've got a wrong view of life, beloved. We could ask the same thing. We could ask God to prosper that business so that we can pride for our family and so that we can give to those who don't have as much. So that we can give to see the gospel penetrate 
See, we need to pray with tenacity and purity. And purity is not our will, it's his will. Daniel was tenacious. Turn to Daniel 6. You want an example? Let me give you one. Daniel 6. Remember Daniel, he was taken away from home at the age of 15 in Israel. Somehow his family had imparted in, in him, age 15 to 19, somewhere in there. We don't know the exact age, but in that teenage years, he was taken away. His family had imparted the, 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 the elements of faith in his life so that he could go into this foreign country in Babylon, 500 miles away from home, which was a long ways in those days, a long ways today. He served there. He took a stand against the king of Babylon. He became a friend of the king of Babylon. I think he led the king of Babylon to a saving relationship with the Lord. Whether or not, he was certainly faithful. Well, he got to be about 80 years old, and he was retired by that time. A whole new regime came in. The Medes and Persians took the Babylonians over. If you want to know how, you can read all about it in Daniel chapter 5. And you, can, you can get further information from Herodias, the historian who writes an account that's very like Daniel chapter 5. A new group came in and they brought Daniel out of retirement because they'd heard about him. And he became one of three main leaders under the king, under King Darius in Babylon. But he was so good that at the age of 80, the king decided he was going to make Daniel number two. He hadn't done it yet, but word got out. And the guys that were his colleagues were jealous. So they decided to use his prayer life against him. You remember the story. They got the king to make a decree that nobody could ask anything or pray any to anybody except the king for the next 30 days. The king was taken in. What was Daniel's reaction? Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, we find Daniel's reaction. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. What an example of tenacious prayer in the faith. His life is on the line, beloved. He knew the penalty. The penalty is you're going to go in the lion's den. He didn't even bother to close the window. So everybody could look in and see what he was doing with his life on the line. Daniel was just as tenacious as in prayer as always. And I love that part. He gave thanks. Don't miss that. He gave thanks for what? For whatever was going to come. He didn't know what was coming. As far as he knew, he would be just as good a food for the lions as whatever else they gave him, right? He gave thanks to have the opportunity to show God forth in this pagan environment. He gave thanks, beloved, before God ever stopped the mouths of the lions without knowing whether that's what was going to happen or not. Do you pray like that? He kept on trusting. He persisted in prayer. How about Abraham? Abraham. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Turn to Chapter 6 and 11, you might hold your place in both of those. But Abraham, you may remember, God came to Abraham when he was 75 years old. He wasn't exactly a, a young buck then, right? 75 years old, and he said, Abraham, I, wanna, I want you to leave your home, and I want you to go somewhere else. Abraham said, where? God said, I'll tell you later. And that's what he did. He took him to Canaan. 75 years old, he told him, I'm going to make your... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a blessing. I'm going to bless you, Abraham, so that you can bless the rest of the world. It took a while for that to happen, but one of his descendants, Jesus, was the greatest blessing the world has ever seen. He said, I'm going to make your seed, your descendants, like the sand of the sea or like the stars of the sky. And Abraham looked around at 75, and guess what? No kids. He didn't have any kids. He and his wife had not been able to have any children up till that point. So this was a promise that was an amazing promise. Well, 10 years later, they took another look around. And guess what? No kids. There's still no descendants, and they're getting older by the day. 
And so Abraham's wife, Sarah, came to him. You remember the story. She said, Abraham, why don't you know, I, I don't, it's pretty clear to me. I'm barren. I'm never going to have any kids. Why don't, you take my, why don't you take my handmaid, Hagar? Take her as your concubine. Have children by her. That was an established way to do this in the society in which they lived. A barren woman would often give one of her handmaids to her husband to have children by. And so they did that. They didn't ask God about that. They just did it. This was their attempt to get God's promise in their own way. Never done that, have you? Never, never been something you thought about? They got a boy. His name was Ishmael. Abram loved that boy. He hadn't had one before. He said to God when the time came, he said, God... Please, accept Ishmael. Perfectly healthy young boy that we've got here. I mean, we've done it. And God said, no, no way. That's, that's not the promise. The promise is through your wife, Sarah. Sarah's the one that this baby has to come from. And so they wait 14 more years. 14 more years. And then God shows up one day. The Lord shows up with two angels. He shows up, I'm sure this was the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, in a pre-incarnate appearance, taking on a body temporarily before he took one permanently, but you can read about it in Genesis 18. They came and they had dinner with Abraham. And during the course of the dinner, they announced next year, Abram, the promise I made you about a son is coming next year. Sarah's listening in the tent. Sarah laughs. She laughed for a really good reason. Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and verse 11 and 12, it tells us that both she and Abraham were too old to have children by now. No wonder she laughed. You would have laughed, right? God made them wait until it was too late. You talk about an appearance of reluctance, right? That's pretty reluctant. But next year, here came little Isaac, the miracle baby, the fulfillment of the promise. You know what the name Isaac means, right? Laughter. Guess who got the last laugh? God did. Here came little baby Isaac, 25 years after they began to pray for him. The answer came when it was impossible for the answer to come. Why? So that God can get the glory. There's no doubt where the blessing came from, right? And despite their trying in their own way to get this baby, despite their laughing at God's promise, despite all of that, the flaws in their life are clear. But despite all of that, there was faith deep in the heart of Abraham and Sarah. How do you know that? Because look at Hebrews 6, 15. Hebrews 6, 15. Because God tells us about Sarah's piece of this too. All right, this is about Abraham. In, in, in chapter 6, verse 15, it says, and thus Abraham having, I love this word, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Is God gracious or what? He hadn't really been all that patient, not from a human perspective. You see, God looked on the heart, and he knew that in spite of what Abram was trying to do in the wrong way, and in spite of the fact that Abram had a very human reaction, and actually, we, we noted where Sarah laughed, but Abram had laughed earlier himself at the promise of God. God counted him patient. Patient. Even though halfway through the trial, he had gone his own way, tried to get this God's promise, tried to get God's blessing in his own way, taken his own foray, written his own script. And even though that was painful for everybody who was involved, ending in the end, having him send, his, send, uh, send uh, Hagar away and send Ishmael, whom he loved, away, had to do that to keep peace in the rest of the family. It hurt. What he did to do on his own hurt, and yet God said, yeah, but he waited patiently. I was seeing his heart the whole time. In verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age. 
since she considered him faithful who had promised. So behind the laugh, there was faith. It's amazing, really. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead. So it wasn't just Sarah that couldn't have kids, neither could Abraham. And by the way, there's an interesting, you know, if you've studied Abraham, you realize he had, he had Isaac, but that wasn't the end. You know, Sarah died eventually, and he had a whole bunch more kids. So when God made him able to have kids, he didn't mess around. Him as good as dead. We're born descendants, as many as the stars in heaven. Beloved, God rewards tenacity. Are you tenacious? Sorry to use a Dodger illustration, but you know, Earl Hersheiser had a great year in 1988 when the Dodgers last won a World Series, much to my chagrin. But Oral Hershiser was the main guy on that team, a pitcher. He's, a, he's, a, he, he's kind of a skinny looking, you know, you wouldn't pick him to be a great pitcher. He's a Christian man, by the way. But when he, you know when he got good? When his manager, Tommy Lasorda, started calling him Bulldog, and he started acting like one. And that's when you will unleash the power of God in your life, too. When you become a Bulldog. When you show God that you care about whatever it is you're praying about as much as you want him to care about it. God wants you to, God wants to know that. It's a test, beloved. I've told you about George Mueller many times. He ran the orphanages in London. Remember that? The, the preacher that started so many, had such an impact on so many lives over so much time. Sometimes prayed food literally onto the table while the kids were sitting there waiting. And yet they never went without. Amazing story of faith. He prayed many people to Christ as well through the years. Toward the end of his life, there was a biographer who had come by. He was going to write his biography. And during the course of their conversation, it came out that Mueller was still praying for a couple of friends who hadn't come to Christ. He had been praying for them for over 60 years. More than 60 years. Years, six, zero years. And the biography asked him if he wasn't a little bit discouraged. You know what he said? Here's what he said. He said, I have not a doubt that I shall meet them both in heaven. For my heavenly Father would not lay upon my heart a burden of prayer for them for over three score years if he had not concerning them purposes of mercy. Both of those people came to Christ after Mueller died. What a heritage, beloved. Who are you praying for to come to Christ? Who, do you, who are you tenaciously bringing before the throne of God? You know, there's a lot of things you can pray about. I can't think of anything more precious to pray about than that somebody would come to Christ. Can you? I mean, if we're not praying for friends and neighbors to come to Christ, we just, we don't have the compassion. We don't have the heart of God. I, I almost think if we're not doing that, we don't have the right to pray for anything else. Pray tenaciously. Secondly, pray shamelessly. To pray with persistence is to pray tenaciously. It is also to pray shamelessly, with urgency. Notice in the middle of verse 8, it says, yet, oh, we're back in Luke 11, by the way. Luke 11, in the middle of verse 8, it says, and yet because of his impudence, he will rise up and give him whatever he needs. The word impudence literally means without shame. Without shame. Shame. The NIV, NIV translates it uh, shameless, shameless audacity. I like that translation, shameless audacity. I think that captures the meaning of that word. Jesus is commending this man's shameless audacity, coming at midnight, getting the whole household up, if that's what it takes. Just won't take no for an answer. And he's suggesting that this is the way we should pray as well. We're invited to our, open our hearts to the Father with shameless audacity. Now listen, beloved, care, be careful. You know, we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because, because we're so good and we're so tenacious? No, 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 no. Because we come with a Savior. Because we come with Jesus on our side. That's why we can have boldness. But if it's true what the Bible says in several places, that the 
fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we must come with boldness, but also with, but also with great reverence, right? Must come with reverence. I, I, I cringe, and I think that's right, when I hear people flippantly, you know, throwing off a little prayer to God. I, f- I think they've forgotten who they're praying to. And yet, beloved, we have the, we have the, we have, we have the Lord bef- before us. We have Jesus coming with us and saying, come boldly. Ask for what you want. Listen, you may not get that. You know why? Because, because Romans tells us the Holy Spirit is praying for us with groanings can- that cannot be uttered in the will of the Father. So if we've got it wrong, he's correcting it. So what actually hits, hits the Lord's desk is what is right. I love that. We must come tenaciously. Turn to Matthew 15. Let me show you an example of how this all plays out. It's a beautiful, beautiful illustration from the life of Christ. He's in his ministry. He's in the middle of his ministry here. And a Gentile mother comes and pursues him. Now that's interesting in itself because Jesus was mainly ministering to the Jewish people. That's who followed him around for the most part even though some of his greatest encounters happen to happen with Gentile people. Because the Jews in general, though they love what he's doing, are basically inside and underneath are rejecting him. So here comes this Gentile mother in Matthew 15, and beginning in verse, well, let's just start at verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the the district of Tyre and Sidon. He's outside of Palestine now. A little bit to the north west up there. He's withdrawn. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was Christ. He must have heard about Jesus. She's Christ. He says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. We're going to see this later, later on in Luke, but that term son of David immediately means messianic. It means that's the Messiah to the Jewish people in Jesus' day. There could be no mistaking that title. So this Gentile woman somehow has come to that point to realize this is this Jesus from Nazareth is both Lord and he's son of David. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But now look at verse 23. He did not answer her a word. What's that about? It's a test, beloved. This is the appearance of reluctance. It's exactly the same thing that Jesus is addressing in Luke 8. It's the appearance of reluctance. So what does she say? Well, okay, I I didn't learn to read or write today. I'm going home. I, I went to Jesus and he didn't even answer me. He wouldn't even talk to me. His disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she's crying out after us. They didn't want anything to do with the Gentiles. And Jesus seems about to concur, extending the test. So it goes from bad to worse. Have you ever prayed and it went from bad to worse? Did God make a mistake? No. God doesn't make mistakes. And God is always good. See, every prayer, every time we're coming to the Lord, this has to underlie our life. God is always good, never anything but good, and God is never reluctant, whatever the appearance. But boy, this woman must have wondered. Verse 24, he finally answered. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. (laughs) So when he finally answers, guess what? More seeming reluctance. I don't know about you, I'm sure I would have concluded by that time, you know what, I I don't think he cares. I might as well leave. Reluctance. Seeming reluctance. But she came, verse 25, and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. Persistence, impudence, shamelessly. No idea what to say, really. Just, Lord, help me. 
I, I, I gave you the details. I, I, my daughter's sick, but now I, I, you seem reluctant. I don't, I don't even know what to say, but please help me. <laughs> look, and look at the answer. Verse 26, he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What? What's going on here? To test. Verse 27, she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. That is shameless audacity. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. What a wonderful example of combining reverence and shamelessness, just like we're invited to do, right? Shameless audacity. Turn to Acts chapter 12. Let me show you another example. Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, I don't think I've ever heard a baby out here before. That's the first time. Shameless audacity. <laughs> another, another example. Um, Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison. After Jesus is gone, the church is getting underway. James has been thrown into prison and, and killed. And there was enough encouragement about that that Herod decided, I'll, I think I'll throw Peter into prison too. So Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 tells us, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer, earnest prayer was made to God by the church. Earnest translates the Greek word ektenos, ektenos, ek, out of, tenos, stretched out. Stre stretched outed prayer, out, uh, stretched outedness, that kind of prayer. That's what's going on in the background as Peter is in jail. The picture is, the, you know, picture those long jumpers, right? And they run down the runway, right? And then they, and then they, hit, the, they, they hit the board and they leap as far as they can, right? And they are straining every inch to get as much distance as they possibly can. They don't care what they look like. They don't care who's watching. They're just straining. They're outstretched to get every every instant they can. And, and the Lord says here, that's the way the church was praying for Peter. Outstretchedly, they were praying. That's the intensity that God is commending. And you remember, they did the same thing for James. See, see this, is, this, is where, this is where we have to get, this is where we have to trust God. They did the same thing for James, and what happened? He was killed. Did God make a mistake? Did God cease to be good? No. That was God's plan for James. And James spent the time in heaven when the rest of the guys were down here, you know, going through what you go through in life. God's good. But God answered for Peter differently. He turned Peter loose. And, 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 the, and the people that Peter went to a house, we think probably John Mark's house, his mother's house, he showed up at the house where the people were praying and, they, and you know, the little girl opened the door and then she closed it because she, she didn't believe Peter was really there. And then she goes back and tells the people that are praying, oh, there's a ghost out here. Why? <laughs> Thank God he answers prayers when we don't even believe very good, right? Because that's what was happening. They were all stressed in prayer and when the answer came that they were seeking, it didn't even happen. Jeremiah 29 says it this way, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's when you'll find me. See, God wants to know that we care as much as, that God, God, wants, God wants to know that we care as much as we want him to care. Jesus practiced what he preached. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us, in the days of his flesh, Listen to this now, Hebrews 5, 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus prayed with tears. 
to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his, I love this word, reverence. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, is praying down here on earth in his human capacity to the Father in heaven, and he's exercising reverence. And we think we can come flippantly to the throne of God. We can't, beloved, no. But he does come shamelessly. You see how the two go together. He came shamelessly. This is Gethsemane. This is, an, this is a description of Gethsemane. And in Luke twenty two forty four, 44, where it talks about Gethsemane, it says, Luke twenty two forty four 44, it says, in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Same word as Acts 12. He prayed more stretched outedly. And Mark tells us how real that was because Mark 14, 35 says, well, he was praying in Gethsemane, going a little further, he fell on the ground. It's an imperfect tense, meaning it happened more than once. He fell, he was falling on the ground and prayed. That's the model for prayer, see? He prayed stretched outedly. He, he prayed with all, the, with all that was in his being because he cared. Have you, ever seen that? Have you ever seen that little picture? There was one in our house when I was growing up. I think it was in my grandmother's room, but there was this picture, this picture of Jesus kneeling by a rock and his hands are like this, right? It's, it's Jesus in Gethsemane. Cute little picture. Gethsemane wasn't anything like that. Nothing. It wasn't even close. This was a battle. This was a battle for your soul and mine that was going on in Gethsemane. What is it, Mar uh, the, uh, the, the film, the, uh, uh, what's his name? Somebody help me. Passion of, Passion of the Christ, thank you. First scene in that film has a much better depiction of what went on in Gethsemane. This was a battle. And you know what? This was a battle Think about it this way as well, beloved. This is a battle for, for the submission in his human nature, for the submission of the Son to the Father. Because let me remind you that when he walked away, whose will was preeminent? Was it Jesus who wanted this cup taken away from him, or was it the Father who said, no, you have to go through this? It was the Father, wasn't it? Prayer is not about aligning God with my will. Prayer is about aligning me with the will of God. R.A. Torrey tells of being in a Bible conference. He's an old, old preacher, established school I went to. He said there was a distinguished Bible teacher that was on the platform with him, and the, and, the, and the guy said, I challenge anyone to show me a single passage in the Bible where we are told to wrestle in prayer. And Torrey writes this way. He says, now one speaker doesn't like to contradict another, right? But there... But here was a challenge, and there I was sitting on the platform. I was obliged to take it up. So I said in a low voice, Romans 1530, brother. <laughs> and he says he was a good enough Greek scholar to know that I had him. He was honest to own it on the spot. What's Romans 1530 say? It says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on your behalf. Agonize, wrestle. With God. It's a test. Do you really want this? Do you really want my will in this? When Jacob came to the end of himself, Jesse read about it earlier today as he returned from Canaan, you know, after 25 years of absence, 20 years of absence, he was scared to death of what his brother Esau was going to do. The reason he left in the first place was because Esau wanted to kill him because he stole the birthright. Remember that? So when he's coming back, he's not sure what Esau's going to be concerned about him. He's scared to death. And interestingly enough, an all-night wrestling match with God ensued. And it ended this way, Genesis 32, 26. It says, then he, God, said, let me go, for the day has broken. That's the appearance of reluctance. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Shameless, stretched out in this in prayer. Now listen, Jacob didn't get away pain-free, right? Lived with a limp for the rest of his life. But he had God's blessing. 
Hebrews 4, 15, and 16, you know, perfectly combines reverence and shamelessness. Remember the verses, Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Boldness with God, beloved, is not a tribute to anything good in us, right? It's a gift granted by the presence of his own son who goes with us as our great high priest to represent us. The very one who invites us to come shamelessly also accompanies us as our mediator. Wonderful thought. Let me close with this. It's a little bit of an extended illustration, but I think it's worth it. William Lane Craig is one of the foremost apologists of our day. Some of you may be acquainted with him. He's been a real leader in establishing a credible academic position for Christian philosophers. William Lane Craig lives in Georgia. He accepted Christ as his Savior September 11th, 1965. And he began immediately praying for his parents because they didn't know Christ. He says this, he says, every day in my devotional time, five days a week for over 30 years, I prayed for their salvation to no avail. It wasn't until, it wasn't because they were hostile to Christ, they just didn't seem to feel any need of him in their lives. He goes on to tell about he and his wife, how he and his wife Jan shared the gospel with his parents many times over the years, but there was never any movement. In fact, it only got worse. His, this, is a, this is apparent reluctance, right? His dad got Parkinson's disease. They moved away from Georgia, moved down to Arizona, a long ways away. But as his dad got older and as the disease progressed, his wife said to him one day, you know, Bill, I think you need to go see your dad. He, he can't have much more time. You need to at least try one more time. So he went to see his dad. And he, and he said to his dad, you know, he said, Dad, I don't know how much longer you've got. He said, I think you really need to think about eternity. And he said his dad's response absolutely floored him because his dad said, I don't really think there's any evidence for life beyond death. Apparent reluctance, right? He said, I was flabbergasted. Here was a man who was about to die of a debilitating disease. You'd think he would be grasping at straws, any hope of immortality, no matter how implausible. Instead, he's talking about evidence. And then he says, you know what? I got really mad. He said, when he was well enough to look at the evidence, he wouldn't do it. Now, he's so disabled, there's no possibility he can really do investigating and look at anything. And so he said, I just told him, Dad... I'm one of the world's foremost experts on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know that I've written books about it. You've read those books. He said, the thing I want you to hear from me right now is that having examined all the evidence that I know to examine, I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most attested events in the history of the world. But he said, you don't have time to investigate anymore. So I have to ask you now to do two things. First, you you need to trust Christ. And secondly, you need to trust that what I'm telling you is true. You need to trust me. And he said, Dad just brushed me off again like he'd always done. He said, yeah, I'll think about it. That was all I could get out of him. So he left, he went home. A few weeks later... His mother called. She said this. She said, your father's been thinking about what you told him. He's ready to make that decision. Jason had that experience just this last week, a sister that we never thought we talked about. We happened to talk about while we were away because of some things that were going on in her, in her life. We didn't have to pray 30 years a couple days with little faith and he, and he called her and she was ready. God works in amazing ways, beloved. 
here after 30 years, he said his dad was ready to make that decision. Craig says, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I couldn't believe my ears. All those years of praying for precisely this, and now it was really here. So he explained to his mom, he said, if dad's heart is already reaching out to God, the salvation has probably already happened, but you need to seal it with prayer. Here's how you pray. You just say, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. I accept your death in my place. Please take whatever I have of life left. I give it to you. It's yours. His mother called the next day and said, said, Bill, we did, we did what, you, what you said and we prayed together. She said it took a long time because of your father's Parkinson's disease. And she said, we did it twice because I just wanted to make sure we're going to the same place. Is that good or what? But listen, listen to how he summarizes his reaction because I think this is what we tend to do. He says, I realized that there had grown up in my heart an unknown root of bitterness toward God because of his seeming unresponsiveness. All those years he seemed to be doing nothing. But now I came to a I came to appreciate what I as a philosopher had known intellectually for some time, that God may be at work providentially to accomplish his purposes in ways that we cannot even detect. He knew all along how to best answer my prayers and I had only to be patient. Don't give up too soon in your prayer for something. Show God that you mean business. Pray tenaciously pray shamefully shamelessly beloved it's because you didn't learn to read and write the first day go back to school let's pray father we thank you thank you that there are enough answers that come quickly to encourage us not only of your reality, but of your love and your goodness. But mostly we take that because we have chosen to accept your word and it clearly teaches that. You never make mistakes. You never get it wrong. But Lord, it's difficult. I, I, I know, Father, that right here this morning, from myself, I'm sure, all the way to the back of the auditorium, there are those of us who have been praying for something for a long time. And we wonder if it's ever going to happen. Father, the first thing I want to do right now is just lead us to number one, submit to your will, whatever it is with regard to that thing that we've been praying for. Perhaps we've been praying selfishly. Perhaps we've been praying only because we want it. We haven't really asked if this is what you want. So right now we renounce that. We give that to you. Having done that, you know the desire of our heart, and so we keep praying that that which you haven't answered yet, will, the answer will come. It will come in your will and in your time. We give ourselves to that right now, Father. And as we pray, as we sing together now, I surrender all. Let that be true. You know, may there not be some holdback that says, I, I, I surrender to God if he does it my way. But no, let the surrender be total. As we do our business with you before we leave this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.